It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Patrick Stover is the director of the Institute for Advancing Health through Agriculture at Texas A&M AgriLife. The IHA is the world's first research institute to bring together precision nutrition, responsive agriculture, and behavioral research to reduce diet-related chronic disease in a way that considers environmental and economic effects. As an international leader in biochemistry, agriculture, and nutrition, Dr. Stover's research focuses on the biochemical, genetic, and epigenetic mechanisms that underlie the relationships among nutrition, food fortification, and human pathologies. He has over 23 years of academic leadership experience, serving as the former president of the American Society for Nutrition, and has served two terms on the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's Food and Nutrition Board. He received from President Clinton the Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers, the government's highest honor bestowed on outstanding scientists and engineers beginning their independent careers. The title of his presentation today is Responsive Agriculture. What do we want from the food system? Welcome, Dr. Stover. Thank you very, very much, Johnny. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with this group. Um, the title of this presentation is really informed by, you know, over the years talking to, me, to many of my colleagues in the nutrition space who always complain about the food system, but then you ask, what do you actually want from the food system? And that's a question that many don't have answers to. But what I wanna to talk today is about if we want agriculture to be the solution to some of the most pressing issues facing not only the US, but global societies, if we want agriculture to be the solution, we need to do two things. Number one, we need to bring the very best science to bear to solve those problems. And number two, we need to make sure that we are a priority. Um, and both of those are critical. And so today I wanna to talk about that relationship between agriculture and health, a word that we describe as responsive agriculture, and I'll tell you the reasons for that. Um, one disclaimer around this is that during this presentation, I will be speaking from a US perspective um, recognizing that there is a global food system and that food systems vary throughout the world, but they're all interconnected. But I'll be speaking directly um, to the U.S. food system, but obviously has global implications. And I will be speaking from a human nutrition perspective. So with that, just want to start by just reviewing what we all know, and that is the food system that we have today really came out of the World War II and post-World War II era where during that period of the Great Depression leading into the war, there was a lot of hunger. There was a lot of poverty. And then we had the war effort in World War II. And during that time period, there was an appreciation and much research done in understanding that connection between food and soldier performance. And as a result of that, a lot of our best food went to the war effort, went to feed our soldiers, and many people were encouraged to start victory gardens and to grow their own food to take the pressure off the food system so we could support the troops. So we began to understand that connection between food and our health and our performance, but also people had a much deeper appreciation for agriculture, a much better appreciation of where their food came from because they were encouraged to grow their own food. And following the World War II era, following the war, there was an appreciation both in the US and globally that in fact, hunger was unacceptable, that we should create a food and agriculture system to make hunger rare. And in fact, we have achieved that. Today, we have the most affordable, abundant, accessible food system globally that has ever existed. Where you do see hunger, it's not because of a lack of food, it's, it's due to generally a lot of access and other confounding issues. So if you look at where we are today, in fact, we still need to increase food production because the world is growing over the next several decades. There's gonna be another 2 billion people on this planet. You can see what the countries that, where that population is going to grow. And we still do have malnourished people and we have to keep that in mind. And so we do have to still keep producing more food. But at the same time, as you see down here, we have an epidemic of diet-related disease, both in the US and globally. And in fact, the treatment of diabetes alone 
which again is caused by a poor alignment between the food system and individual behavior, we have, um, you know, we're spending over 160 billion a year, which is more than what you see um, the funding level of most US federal agencies. And this is just a map just showing between 2004 and 2019, the growth of type two diabetes in this country, much of it driven by obesity. And when we look at obesity in the US, we also see that it is not evenly distributed. And my next slide's not coming up, there it is. But if you see on these maps, uh, in the left upper hand corner, you see that obesity rates aren't the same in the US. And a lot of that is driven by the disproportionate share of obesity and other diet related diseases that are present in our underserved populations. And so we have a food crisis. We have a food system that was designed to eliminate hunger. It was incredibly successful in doing this, but an unintended consequence was this food system has led to diet-related chronic disease and exacerbated um, inequities that we have in this country. And again, the same is true globally. And this is now beginning to direct, directly affect life expectancies. If you look at life expectancies across different groups in the US, you see again that, some of our, that many of our underserved populations are the ones who are also suffering um, decreases in lifespan that again is driven by diet related chronic disease. And one of the questions we have to ask ourselves really is we, we have a real problem here, not only the ridiculous healthcare costs that are associated with diet related chronic disease, but also having a stable society where you see such disparities in that relationship between the food we eat and individual health. So there's been a lot of focus on agriculture and food systems around these issues of health, whether it's environmental health, human health, economic health. And with that come, you know, mandates for the food system. So historically, again, focused on hunger in the economy, agriculture was scaled and designed to produce, produce and produce in abundance food, fiber and fuel. The new expectations we have is food for lifelong health, and I'll speak to that in a moment, to protect and sustain our environment and to make sure that agriculture is economically viable. Because if it's not economically viable, nothing else matters. We're not going to have a viable agriculture system. During COVID, we learned a lot about our food system and the connection with individual health. We learned, in fact, that the food system performed fairly well much better than many people expected. There were a few glitches, but by and large, food shortages when they occurred were very transient. But we also learned that the system is highly vertically integrated and needs more resiliency in that food system. On the consumer side, we saw those with diet-related chronic diseases, particularly those who had diabetes, those who were suffering from obesity, had some of the highest rates of morbidity and mortality from the virus. But it also told us and has taught us that we have to look for other vulnerabilities within the agriculture food system. And climate variability and climate change is also seen as an impending threat to our food system. We are seeing right now remarkable variability in climate. You, not only are we seeing hotter temperatures and sometimes colder temperatures, but you're seeing a lot of variability between those, which is a problem because we can breed and we can adjust for higher temperatures or lower temperatures. But when you have extreme variations between hot and cold, it becomes very, very difficult to create a food system that can withstand that variability. You see the same thing going on with water going from drought to floods in, in um, rapid succession. And in terms of economic growth, we see, in fact, that there is development on much of our precious farmlands all across the country because the land is more valuable to developers than it is to our producers. And in fact, you see many producers putting solar panels on their land because it's more profitable than growing food. So there are also some economic gaps that we have. Furthermore, there's a lot of concerns about the unintended costs of food. 
again, we have a food system that was designed to eliminate hunger. And so to make food abundant and affordable and accessible to all the population, margins are very, very low. But the unintended consequence here is the externality of driving healthcare costs. It's estimated that diet-related um, healthcare costs in the US are about $4 trillion a year in total. And it's, there is no state and there is no company that can, that can afford these sorts of healthcare costs and they continue to rise. And so one of the questions is, how do you deal with that externality, that economic externality of the food system where it's generating healthcare costs, yet it's performing the way it was meant to. It is making food affordable, accessible to eliminate hunger. And how do we deal with that externality? And in fact, in the 2020 Agriculture Appropriations Bill in the US, there is specific language in there asking the USDA to report back to Congress on how agriculture can be the solution to rising health care costs that are of such concern to all of our members of our legislature. So this cover of Nature from 2010 that was talking about or speaking to population growth, asking the question, can we produce more? Can science feed the world? That's really pivoted now to how do we feed a world in a way that keeps people healthy? What is that? How can we fix that misalignment we currently have between the food system and food environment we create and then the consumer and maximizing the potential for the consumer to make helpful choices? And so this is our challenge. We have four complex dynamic systems here. We have our food systems, we have people in society, we have the environment, we have economics. All of these are complex dynamic systems that, that interact and they interact very strongly across these four spaces. And how can we bring them into better alignment for the benefit of the people, for the, for, for the benefit of the environment? So with that, I'm gonna first begin to pivot and talk about from a human nutrition perspective, what do we want from the food system? And what I sh I'm showing there is a consensus study report. I was a member of this panel for developing dietary reference intakes based on chronic disease endpoints. So let me speak to that a minute. The dietary reference intakes, if you're not familiar, are developed for every single nutrient. And those, one of the, met or the, um, the numerical values that comes out of that process is the RDA. That is how much of every nutrient you should consume every day, how much iron, how much zinc, how much energy, et cetera. We have been developing DRIs for most of the history of giving food-based and nutrient-based guidance to prevent hunger, both hidden hunger, micro, lack of mi micronutrients, um, as well as physical hunger, lack of calories. But what Congress said to the National Academies, it says, why are you setting the, the dietary reference intakes? And again, those are important because those numbers translate then into what the Dietary Guidelines of America will recommend, which then translates into all food assistance programs and how we think about food and agriculture policy. So this is really an important foundational document that really dictates all across the food system how we want to configure it. And Congress said, well, we don't really have that much hunger anymore that's due to a lack of food production. And in fact, we also don't have scurvy and these other diseases of nutrient deficiencies. Very, um, they're, 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 they're just not prevalent in the population. What we have is a chronic disease epidemic. And so can we change the endpoint of the food system from avoiding hunger to creating healthy people and lowering healthcare costs. So that is a, what the challenge is and sets a fundamental new endpoint for the food system. And the question is, what does that mean for the food system? So I'm gonna give you an example of a story, something that I've been involved with throughout my career, but really informed a lot of this mandate to make agriculture and the food system the solution to health. And it relates to folic acid, a, a B vitamin, and birth outcomes and avoiding birth defects. So let me just quickly go through the story to give you some of the nuances and the challenges we face. 
During very early embryonic development for a woman between day 23 and 28 of gestation before she even knows she's pregnant, the neural tube will close. That is, you have three cell layers, and during this time, you begin to go from a, 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 a two-dimensional organism to a three-dimensional organism where the neural tube actually closes. And you see that going on right here. This is the head closing. This is the trunk regions. The limbs will come out here. And during this critical time of development, the neural epithelium proliferates at the, at the highest rates of cell proliferation that probably you'll ever experience in your life. And during that critical window, again, between day 23 and 28 in humans, if you do not achieve closure, you don't have sufficient proliferation of cells to close, you will have an open pore in the trunk region and or an open head, essentially, and it will remain open throughout the rest of gestation. If the head doesn't close, cranial ratchet that's going to be lethal at birth. If it doesn't close in the trunk, you're going to have migration of nerve cells out of that pore, and this individual will be paralyzed from the site of the lesion down. So this is a horrific birth defect. It's called spina bifida or exencephaly in the family of neural tube defects. Um, and again, tremendous burden on families who suffer from that. So it is one of the more quote unquote common or was birth defects. And we're talking here, and this is important, about 2,500 births a year. We know the rate is higher in developing countries. We know the recurrence rate is high. That is, I have an affected child and I have another affected child. So it gets even higher in terms of the rates from one in two to 1,000 to one in five and 100. So we know there's a strong genetic component to this. And again, we know that this birth defect happens often before a woman even knows she's pregnant. But there's a great public health success story here. In the 60s, when a mother presented with a child with neural tube defect, she showed all of the biomarkers of not having enough folate circulating in her blood. Now, there were a lot of women who had perfectly normal births who also had low folate in their blood, but this was common to virtually all of the women who presented with a birth defect. So there were clinical trials giving women a folic acid pill, and guess what? It worked remarkably. 72% reduction in neural tube defect frequency for those who got the folic acid supplement, leading to recommendations to take folic acid before you're pregnant, because again, the defect happens before a woman even knows she's pregnant. Most pregnancies are unplanned, um, but of course, because they're unplanned, women don't take the folic acid. So these public health campaigns did not work very well, leading then to the US to fortify the food supply with folic acid. And they did this through the labeling authority of the FDA into enriched grains. Now, this is important. This was the first time we ever used fortification of the food supply for a health outcome. Every time we have fortified in the past, whether it be, you know, niacin or iron, et cetera, it was done because there was a deficiency of that nutrient in the population in the food system. That wasn't the case here. There was not a population-wide deficiency in folic acid. There were women who needed folic acid to prevent a birth defect. So it's the first time we ever fortified for a health outcome. And everywhere around the world where we have fortified the food supply with folic acid, we have seen dramatic reductions in the prevalence of neural tube defect affected pregnancy. So here agriculture for the food system was the solution. And these are countries that fortify, dark blue is mandatory, um, light blue is voluntary. But what you'll notice is that Europe is not fortified. Why is that? And there's several nuances. Again, this is the first time we ever fortified the food system, not to deal with a nutrition issue, it wasn't there, it's to affect a health outcome, to remedy a rare disorder. It exposes everyone with this folic acid, but targets a small population subgroup. That is that 2,500 births a year. So we're targeting women, women of childbearing age, women of childbearing age who are genetically susceptible to having a birth defect. We know there's a genetic component to this. Most women, if they become folate deficient, it's not going to lead to a neural tube defect. Most animals, it won't lead to a neural tube defect. There were individuals who are genetically sensitized. We can't identify them. They need more folic acid than they can get out of a food-based diet, natural food-based diet to achieve neural tube defect prevention. 
We don't know the mechanism. That's the focus of my laboratory. But there's other observational studies that suggest that other people may be um, having adverse effects from fortification. There's no strong evidence for that, but there is concern in the oncology community and others that we're benefiting 2,500, but maybe we're giving risk to other people. Um, again, no strong evidence for that, but there's a large observational literature around that. And all of these facts give you, exacerbate these common concerns of unintended consequences. So when we begin to use health as the outcome, it becomes very complicated in terms of responders and non-responders who benefits who accrues risk. And so I want to get into some of the nuances of that and what it means for the food system. So when we talk about avoiding deficiency, a hunger or a hidden hunger, it's very simple because nutrient deficiencies have a single cause in most cases in healthy people and they manifest the same in all people. So you can take a population-based approach. But when you go to the chronic disease endpoint, you have to consider other effects of food. Some foods are inflammatory for people. Approximately 20% of the US population is estimated has a food intolerance, one or more. The stress response of food, the immune response of food, et cetera. We know that diet-related chronic diseases are complex. It's not only what you eat, but it's your sleep, it's your exercise, it's your, it's your genetics. And so you see great heterogeneity in the population in terms of how people react to diet. Chronic diseases aren't about single nutrients the way deficiencies are. Important for the agriculture community and a big opportunity, I think, is that when we switch to a chronic disease endpoint, we're not talking about essential nutrients anymore. If you have a nutrient deficiency, that relates to essential nutrients. If you don't have that, that nutrient in your body, you're not going to be able to live. But when you move to the health outcome, now there are other components of food that aren't essential for life, but can improve your health or can help reduce chronic disease risk. These are now eligible for receiving or for being evaluated for a DRI if there's strong evidence that this, in fact, food component, whatever it is, can help manage or prevent a disease then it can go into the dietary guidelines, then it becomes part of all food assistance programs, et cetera. So it's really opened up our understanding now and our availability to promote public health, if you will, by understanding and getting the strong evidence for other components of food and how they affect health. And of course, the other problem is responders and non-responders. We all react differently to food in terms of health outcomes. In terms of deficiency outcomes, we don't, but in terms of health outcomes, as Francis Collins, the former director of NIH said, one size does not fit all. So what does the science tell us about the biological premise of precision nutrition? So precision nutrition is this idea that when we switched from hunger is the endpoint or hidden, hidden hunger to health, now, people react differently. So we need greater precision in how we determine what people should eat, the food guidance that we give to people and what they should eat, and our food policies like, like fortification, because we know that people respond differently in that health outcome, not in the deficiency outcome. Why is that? Well, this goes back to 2003, and this is a cover of Scientific American that says food for thought. Dietary change was a driving force in human evolution. If you look at the human genome and you look at changes in the human genome over time, okay, that is the creation of variation, what you see is that all genes do not change or evolve, if you will, at the same rate. There are some genes that are not very variable among human populations and even among species. There's others that are highly variable. The most variable genes you see in terms of variation in the human genome is genes related to nutrition, metabolism, and to immune function. Why is that? Well, foods, people, human populations emerged all over the world. Those that emerged all over the world did so and succeeded and expanded their population because they were able to adapt to their local food system and their local pathogen environment. And so if you look at population in Scandinavia, there's not very much iron in the soil in Scandinavia. 
So populations that emerged there became really, really good at getting every little bit of iron out of the food they ate. But when you put them on a global food system that has more iron in it, they get very high rates of hemochromatosis because they then absorb too much iron and they rust and they have iron-related chronic diseases, iron overload diseases. If you look at Inuit populations in Northern Canada, they metabolize fat very, very different than the rest of the world. And in fact, their relationship between fat and health is very different from people you see in other parts of the world. And you could go on and on lactose intolerance and things like this. But in fact, this is why it's really important to have a highly diversified food system This is at this point and why it's really important to protect all of our biodiversity in terms of food sources available to us because that's what the human genome evolved to. It evolved to these environments, to these local food systems in terms of their health. And of course, these are major initiatives now how we begin to wrap our arms around that by the USDA and the NIH. Proof of principle here. One of my favorite studies was done by David Threadgill back in 2017. He took four different strains of mice. He took these four different strains of inbred mice and gave them four different diets. So it's a four by four study and put them on those diets from weaning and aged them out for I think eight, 18 months. And he asked the question, what diet was the best in terms of everything he measured? And he measured everything. He measured biomarkers. He measured mutation rates, um, ep epigenetic profiles, biomarkers of health, everything that you can measure. And in fact, you couldn't say one diet was better than the other. It depended on which mouse strain you were studying, and it depended on what health outcome you had an interest in. So we see this idea of precision and variability in response to diet, even among mice. That is, there has to be a better match between individuals and the food they eat that's really rooted in a revolutionary history. So what does precision nutrition mean for the food supply? And we've spoken to many agriculture producers about this, and how do we go about thinking about agriculture as the solution to human health and lowering rates of chronic disease when we know one size doesn't fit all? And again, I will repeat, what's really important is that at this point, we have a highly diversified food system and that we protect the biodiversity of all of our staple food crops as we begin to understand that connection between what we eat and health. But the question is, how are we going to get there? How are we going to make agriculture and food systems part of the solution to lowering healthcare costs? Well, there's lots of opportunities to do that. I was on this National Academy of Science panel that created this um, infogram here, but really describes the food system. And what we have food and services growing and are moving in one direction from farm inputs to the consumer, consumer behavior, money and demand inf information, and the reverse flow really informing the flow to the right. But what we see here is that all of these circles represent opportunities to better align the food system with human health outcomes. We can do it through social organizations and these mechanisms. We can do it through science and technology. We can do it through bi the biophysical environment. We can do it through consumer behavior. We can do it through various policies in the government. So we can make the food system whatever we want. We have tools to do this. But the big question is how do we align the food system in a way that maximizes the opportunity for the consumer to be able to improve their health. That's the challenge. So what we have done at Texas A&M, and we're essentially a year into this, is we created the Institute for Advancing Health Through Agriculture, and we created the Agriculture, Food, and Nutrition Scientific Evidence Center. And the way that we really um, approach this problem of making agriculture the solution to human health was breaking out the research into audiences. So there's producers and research, how do we make a production system again that is aligned for human health? And we use the term and coin the term responsive agriculture, which I'll speak to. For the consumer, if we're, health is gonna be the outcome, it's precision nutrition. How do we understand variability in response to diet? And how do we inform individuals about what their connection is with the food that they eat in terms of the health outcome. 
Then we created another entity for decision and policymakers. And we wanted a firewall around this entity because we want this organization here, which we have not announced yet, we're going to be announcing it in the next couple of months, will be in Fort Worth, but it'll be an agriculture, food and nutrition evidence center. If you look in the field of medicine, evidence centers are very common. In medicine, people don't argue, is aspirin good for you or is aspirin bad for you? There are evidence centers that take all of the literature, all of the data, they combine the data in a statistically appropriate way and they say, well, this is good or this is bad. And this is how confident we are in saying that in terms of the data and the signal to noise ratio. And so therefore in medicine, we take an evidence-based approach. In agriculture, food and nutrition, there are emerging attempts to try to bring more of an evidence approach to the decisions we make, but it's very much in its infancy. So we created the very first agriculture, food and nutrition scientific evidence center that will be available to decision makers, to policy makers, if they have any question around the food system, a practice, a policy, um, any terms of effects of the food system, we will do a evidence synthesis using best practices around any question and what the economic, the environmental, and the human health impacts are relative to that question. So we're really excited about this. It's getting a lot of attention right now in Washington. And again, we are going to be um, uh, announcing that very, very soon. But now I wanna talk right now and speak to responsive agriculture. So when we talk about the food system, we talk about the agriculture system that leads to that food environment. What we want is a food environment that maximizes opportunity to make agriculture the solution to healthcare costs. So we have defined responsive agriculture is an agriculture system and food environment that supports health through nutrition while ensuring the system is economically and environmentally sustainable for future generations. What is key in this definition is there are many demands on the food system. There's, you hear a lot about the environmental demands on the food system. You hear a lot about the economic effects of the food system. You hear about the human health effects of the food system. What we are saying is that fundamentally the outcome has to be human health. We used to be hunger, it has to be human health. And once we get to a point where we have the strong science of what human health means in terms of precision nutrition, in terms of chronic disease outcomes, we have to do that in a way that is economically and environmentally sustainable. But human health has to drive the bus. Outside of the frame of responsive agriculture, are other truths that we recognize. That is the food system is global and interconnected, but we're really focusing our efforts right now on the US food and ag system. Individual choices affect agency. So we're not talking about the consumer here. We're talking about a food system that maximizes the consumer to make the right choices and to have the agency to make the proper choices. And we also recognize that agriculture is more than food, but we're speaking specifically here to food agriculture that supports the food system. And with that, again, we recognize that if we want health to be the outcome, we have to consider the entire production chain and look at every opportunity from farm inputs all the way to what then is presented to the consumer in that food environment if we want to achieve agriculture as the solution to human health. We can do this if there is the will to do it. As you know, we have unprecedented abilities to manage and engineer agriculture and food systems and the environment to achieve any goals we want. We just have to be a priority and we have to bring the very best science to that. We have tools and technologies, the gene banks and germplasm that you all have and preserve are just a remarkable resource to better connect the food supply and human health. It's a great opportunity. There's a great demand to do that because of healthcare costs. That's the motivating factor for a lot of the decision makers, but we can do that. But we do have barriers. Listed on this page here is a number of products or, or um, uh, agriculture um, products here, both animal and plant that have been manipulated to improve the nutrient profile. All of these are sitting on shelves for regulatory and other reasons. 
So we have the ability to make the food system whatever we want. We just have to take advantage of all of our opportunities, whether it's additional research or changes in regulation to make that happen. And again, our goal is to make agriculture the solution to the health care crisis we have, and also to help protect the environment. But we have to do it in a way that is going to support the agriculture economy. So within responsive agriculture, one of the initiatives that we started is what we're calling the ultimate grand challenge. So we partnered with the Chicago Council in November and we brought in many distinguished speakers. This you may know, uh, Dr. Prabhu Pingali, my old Cornell colleague. We had folks from FAO. We had the Undersecretary of the USDA President, Shivana Jacobs Young. We had people from all sectors of the food system. And again, that's part of our ethos is if we're going to solve this problem, everyone needs a seat at the table to really begin to have a conversation about how do we create human health through responsive agriculture. This was a very successful event for us that is now leading to the creation of working groups that we're calling TLCs or thought leader committees. This will be announced very soon by the Chicago Council, but we are going to start an 18 month long initiative where we're going to make agriculture the priority. And that priority around how we deal with the healthcare crisis, how we deal with the chronic disease epidemic. So one of these groups, and again, we hope to have some of the very best minds all across the whole agriculture value chain asking, what are the priorities to achieve a food system that supports lifelong health and reduces healthcare costs? What does that look like? And what priorities can we set now with the knowledge we have now? And what are the barriers to achieving those that we can hand off to decision makers? What are the priorities that we may not have knowledge now, but we need to be the focus of research to be able to achieve um, that goal of reducing healthcare costs? And then what are the long-term priorities? This committee will then cascade into another committee that's going to be looking at sustainable food production. That is, how do we create that food environment and that food system in a way that has the smallest possible environmental footprint and is economically sustainable and resilient. And that cascades into the nutrition equity space. Again, most of the driver, the healthcare costs, most of those healthcare costs are borne by our underserved communities and the food environments in which they exist. So how do we then bring together the chronic disease reduction with sustainable food production with sustainable food production in a way that's going to reach everyone. So we hope any of you who have interest in this, please contact me. We are going to have a portal open soon for people who would like to nominate someone or themselves, but we need all the best minds across the food system. We need representatives of all the various domains of the food system as we take this on. Another barrier to achieving agriculture as the solution to human health is the public perception. This is just a Pew poll from, that looked at nutrition scientists. I think it was about a year and a half ago. And guess what? The public is very skeptical of nutrition scientists. Only 51% have a mostly positive view. When you talk about cares about the best interests of the public, only 29% says some of the time or the most of the time. We have a trust gap in nutrition with the public, but you see some of that also in the agriculture space as well. When I was president of the American Society for, for Nutrition, we launched an initiative to try to do a scoping review of the literature asking, what are the best practices in nutrition science? But there was also a lot of the sort of agriculture um, interconnection that was also in this report to earn and keep the public's trust. And what was really interesting about this is that if you look at Pew surveys and you ask and you look at trust of science, trust in scientists, we are at an all time high in terms of public trust in science and scientists overall. Never been higher. Where you see the disconnect between the public and trust around science and scientists is when the science conflicts with their political or personal views their values and beliefs. 
that's the big problem we have in terms of genetic technologies. It's the big problem we have in, among others in dietary advice. But for the space that we are in, in agriculture and food, we have to be able to communicate and get that public support for us in a way that counters some of the narrative around beliefs, around values, around preferences, around politics, if we're going to be successful. Because we can do all the great science in the world, but it, if, if it is not adapted and, and there's not good uptake by the general population, then we're see. That's one role that the evidence center will play in. This evidence center that I spoke to that's going to be doing evidence synthesis is going to differentiate sciences from preferences, values, and beliefs that we run into and promote public trust. Because we are going to be and hope to be with all of you as partners, the definitive voices. This is what the science says about the role of agriculture in human health, environmental health, economic health. We're not going to have this study says this and that study says that. We're going to do evidence synthesis and see what the totality of the evidence is and what the gaps are in that evidence. We presented some of this and at the AAAS annual meeting, which was very well received, the need for evidence and science to achieve these expectations of the food system. It will be in downtown Fort Worth in the redevelopment district. We haven't actually announced the actual evidence center yet, but again, that will happen within a couple months. But I just wanna close with saying Norman Borlaug was an incredible, incredible visionary and incredible scientist. Hunger was the endpoint of the food system, and it was science and people like Norman Borlaug who made that happen. Intensifying agriculture, creating crops that could be grown all over the world to eliminate hunger. Now we need a Borlaug too, if you will. You've heard, heard that, that, that saying often. How do we then now adapt the agriculture system for the new expectation is not only to alleviate hunger, but then to create healthy people. And again, we've done this before, we can do it again. The challenges are enormous, but we can bring the science-based solutions that are needed. We just have to be a priority. Everyone needs a seat at the table and we will be able to do this, but partnerships are going to be absolutely key. So I'm happy to take questions and have a dialogue. If you'd like to learn more about the IHA, our website is still in development, but it will tell you more about who we are. So with that, I thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Stover. That was wonderful. A great walkthrough. Um, thanks for the background. Um, one thing actually stuck to my mind and you said um, health drives the bus. So, so for gene banks and bringing it back because most of our, our, our uh, participants here today are gene bank managers, gene bank technicians or people related to gene banks. We normally emphasize climate change. We normally emphasize uh, human uh, uncivil civil unrest, you know, uprisings and things like that. We're saving the seed for humanity in the future. Mm -hmm. So if, if, that, if the message now is we should drive agriculture for health, the gene banks are a depository for an immense wealth of biodiversity. And I think one of the messages that we could have uh, and we would love to have a seat in this in this new initiative. I think somebody from the gene bank community should sit and say, we are the treasure trove of diversity. We would like a seat uh, and also change the message a little bit. It is about climate change. It is about, you know, saving seeds for the future, but it's also about health right now. So address an issue right now. So is it possible for the gene banks to participate in this new creation and have a seat uh, and kind of, you know, plug in to the rest of, of, of the activities that are going on early on right now? Well, you know, of course, from my perspective, absolutely. Not only does everybody need a seat at the table, but having the diversified agriculture system is going to be essential if we're going to achieve health for everyone. I mean, there's just no question about that. That's what the science tells us. I don't think we have to pit these outcomes against each other in terms of environmental sustainability or economics or human health. They don't have to be pit against each other. But if you're going to reverse engineer a food system, if you reverse engineer it around an environmental outcome, that's not the purpose of the food system. The purpose of the food system is to support people. And at the end of the day, if it doesn't support people, it's never going to get public support or the political will that we need. 
we, and that's why we have intentionally framed this, is that human health should be the priority. That is why we grow food. We grow food to feed people. And we need to figure that out in a way. And we need a diversified food system to do that. Again, the evolutionary biology tells us that. We see great diversity in how various bioactives that are different, that, that are present in very variety of different food systems interact very differently among people to support health. That again is based on historical food systems that people adapted to. We need that biodiversity. We need to understand the science behind that. But health has to be the driving outcome and then do it in a way that's environmentally and economically sustainable or you've defeated the purpose of food, number one. And number two, you're never gonna get the public support for this, ever. Yeah. Everybody wants to be healthy. Unfortunately, not everybody cares about the environment. We know that. But they can work together and they can help. You can have the coattails of the health bring everything else along very, very nicely. And that's quite frankly, one of the ways that we sell this in Texas, you know? That we can lower your healthcare costs. We can address this crisis. And we need to do it in a way that's sustainable for future generations. And that's where the environment comes in. That's where the economics comes in. Wonderful. We have a few comments and questions. Um, the first one, not in the order that they're there, but what if you could speak a little bit about Co-Train? I know you said it's coming. It's, it's not yet announced. But can we know a little bit more about what it will do and exactly how can um, for example, gene banks be involved in it. What what role would plant health, you know, health and plant uh, genetic resources play in that uh, new institution? Sure. So when you have an evidence center, you have to have best practices around this. What and again, a lot of these have been defined and developed through very uh, through various medical evidence centers. What's important in this is that you have, in terms of synthesizing the evidence, so if you want to know the connection between a food and any outcome, or a food practice or an agriculture practice and any outcome, right? And again, we, pri we do synthesis around human health, environmental impact, economic impact, and synthesize those evidence and looks at the trade-offs across those. What's important is, number one, is that the core group of analysts, and these are analysts, people who know data and know how to combine data, are agnostic to the question. They don't come in with biases and these sorts of things, but they are data experts. Surrounding them, then you need people who are content experts around that question, because the data synthesis can go haywire if people don't have a good, if it's not grounded in context and expertise. And so you need then a cadre, a resource of content-based experts that the analysts can draw on when they have a question related to data and the science of, you know, how the data relates to the science. And so we are now put together and hired someone out of Health Canada who is expert at this in terms of evidence synthesis and then how it's used in policy. She is putting together a core group of analysts and already getting interest in contracts from international agencies to do this type of work. Um, but we need to build up a pool of content-based experts in these various areas for them to draw on. And we would love gene banks to, to make scientists available to us when there is a particular question where um, we need that, that expert point of view relative to what the data are saying. Yeah. Related to that question, has anyone asked the Scientific Evidence Center about crop diversity in general and in gene banks in particular? Again, an evidence center works around a particular question related to a policy. So it, is, it would be a policy question. So where something like gene banks would come into is, um, you know, could relate to what type of diversity do we need in a food environment that's going to support the human health needs of everyone? Something like that, that does that reverse type of, anal of, of analysis. It could relate to sugar taxes that they have on soda, right? And what effect do they have? Health effect, environmental health uh, effect, economic health. But Every, an evidence synthesis center works or starts from a fundamental question that needs to be answered 
to address a particular decision, whether it's a policy or a practice or a regulation or a deregulation. That's the way it works. So it starts with a fundamental question that a decision maker has. Okay, thank you. Um, we have an assortment of different topics, but I'll start with the first. Could the gut microbiome be an alternative to fortification? So people have looked at this question. Um, I'll say this more broadly. Um, and I hope somebody does this. I talk to people about this. I can't get anybody to, to work on this. But when people look at, let me just give you an example of um, where, you, where, where, where you have this controlled environmental agriculture and aquaculture. Plants in the setting of aquaculture will take up virtually any nutrient. They'll take up vitamin B12 that you have that's only present right now in meat sources. They'll take that up and they'll take it up at pretty high levels. Nobody's looked at the bioavailability or anything, but that's expensive to do. But if you could create a microbiome that then is letting out all of these nutrients in these aquaculture systems, I mean, that would be absolutely incredible. It would be um, lower input costs re re remarkably for those systems and everything else. So yes, in theory, there's a great opportunity for that. In terms of the human microbiome, people have engineered bacteria um, to produce or overproduce specific nutrients. But then you're putting essentially a GMO, you know, is the idea you're going to transplant that into a human and this and that. So there are people who I know are interested in this and working on it in mouse models and things like this. Um, our gut microbiome does make many essential nutrients that are absorbed. They're just not produced in sufficient quantities um, to meet human needs, with the exception of biotin. Some argue that the gut microbiome makes enough biotin, that biotin really isn't essential if you have a healthy microbiome. But certainly, you know, the microbiome is a source of, of, of nutrients for all mammals. Okay, thanks. Um, this, is, this is more of um, a stepwise. Um, about the steps that are needed, uh, and I'm trying to interpret what they wrote here, it's the steps that are needed uh, regarding nutritional diversity in plant genetic resources. So, so from what you know in gene banks, what would be the first step that you would take, first and second and third step, from the gene bank perspective, to be able to promote more of this health that you're that you're talking about. So what what should we do? Should we screen more? Shall we create subsets with high nutrition? Who shall we reach out to? How do we promote this? From your perspective, what what is our lacking? What are we lacking in that we're not making enough noise about health as yet to be recognized as and invited to the table as one of these diverse you know groups of people that hold a lot of diversity. And again, I'm going to give you the perspective from the human nutrition side. That's because that's, you know, where I exist. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities, both short term and long term. When you think about, again, health is the outcome rather than avoiding deficiencies. It opens up an incredible space. And we're on the precision nutrition side. We are looking at this but it opens up an incredible space for introduction of different foods or different cultivars. And again, the reason I say that is because food allergies are much more common than they were previously recognized. Stress responses, oxidative stress, uh, oxidative stress responses, immune responses, other toxic responses, um, or responses that, that, that actually lower toxicity of food components. Um, are now increasingly being appreciated. And if you're talking about the health outcome now, you have to understand that interaction. Because if 20% of the people have some sort of a food intolerance and it's recognized, think of how many people have an unrecognized lower grade food response that causes chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation is the fundamental driver of virtually all chronic disease. So we need to be able to test different cultivars. You know, this is especially true in peanuts. If you look at allergic reactions to peanut, it varies among cultivars. If we need to be able to do rapid screening of cultivars 
for these other effects of food that relate to health, including stress and immune responses. And we're thinking about and, and starting to do high throughput screens for this. The other thing relates to composition. The composition of different cultivars of different crops are different. They have these different bioactive food components. How can we actively screen for efficacy of these individual components in promoting health? And again, that will increase the diversity of the food supply tremendously if we're able to show this. And number two, again, we'll better be able to match people to health. And for some reason, my team's just went away, put that away. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunities for that. We need more data, both on the composition of the wonderful resource that you have and variation in that composition, and then how that composition affects biological functions, um, both in terms of, you know, inflammatory immune, those other effects of food that are directly related to health, but then also for these other nutrients that are present in food that aren't essential for life, but are essential for health. And as you discover those, if, if you're able to show a health effect, these will rapidly become incorporated into the whole system because then they will have to have a dietary reference intake, an RDA, which then will affect dietary guidance, which then will affect the food we grow. So there'll be a cascading effect. But again, that's part of that shift from hunger to health. Lots of opportunity for science, a lot of opportunities to understand the biodiversity of the plants we have and how that relates to composition that affects health. Okay. You've answered all of them except one. And I think this will be our last question because in one way or another, all the other ones uh, have been answered. Uh, this is from Nigeria. How can we use the link between nutrition and health to encourage policymakers to support gene bank operations so as to preserve nutritional diversity? And again, you know, being, you know, I, you know, you, you always have to live in two spaces. You, you have your own preferences and values and beliefs around everything science and what we should do. And then there's what's actionable and what you can get public support for. And in my view and in my experience, what policymakers are interested in is solving problems they have in front of them right now. Dealing with biodiversity will make a lot of people, you know, scientists will support that and this and that. The general public is going to be hard to get behind that. And quite frankly, that goal is longer than, you know, and uh, the time frame that an elected official sits in that office. So, you know, it's it, long term investments are really tough these days. If you talk about the health, the health effect, that is, we understand now that diet is making people sick. That it is having the worst consequence on kids right now. And you see rates of disease in kids and obesity at levels we've never seen before. And it's complex and it's not just eating behavior. We need to understand how people need to be matched to food, what the historic food systems were that created populations that thrived, how those food systems don't exist anymore, and how from this resource of biodiversity, we can restore food systems that'll be very contextually dependent probably, that's what the science tells us because it relates to you know, adaptations that have happened over a million years, millions and millions of years, um, how can we begin to restore that biodiversity in a way that supports the health of our populations and deals with healthcare costs? And again, in a way that is environmentally sustainable and economically sustainable. And the economically sustainable thing isn't so hard argument to make because nobody can afford the healthcare costs. We have to keep yeah. tying back to healthcare costs because that's where the money is. It's not on the farm, it's in, it's, it's in, you know, it's in pharma and we need to, to, re, to rebalance that effort. But again, the health argument, I think works for everyone. And again, that's the purpose of the food system. The purpose of the food system is to feed people. And so let's start there, let's get that right. And then it floats all boats. Wonderful. Well, we did want to thank you, Dr. Silver, for presenting. This has been a wonderful discussion. I think you've opened up some ideas which may have been dormant for quite some time. And that is that health does drive the agricultural bus. 
uh, and we'll keep pushing for that. Uh, thank you very much for the time you spent preparing and showing us uh, your work. It's been wonderful. Um, to all participants, thank you very much for, for signing on today and listening to us. We hope to see you again in a no, another GROW webinar in a couple of months. Dr. Stover, some last words from you? No, just thank you all very much. Again, I'm happy to speak with you at any time. Um, again, this, this work that, that we're doing right now is part of the Institute and part of you know, the, the transformational research we want to do to make Ag the solution. If any of you have questions or want to join with us, become visiting members of the Institute or affiliates, please let me know. We'll get you on our mailing list. Um, this doesn't relate to my own personal research. It's really trying to understand genetic variation in one carbon metabolism and how that affects birth outcomes. So that's my other life. I brought in a little bit of that, but this is something that's very near and dear to our heart and um, is just, I think, absolutely critical to address you know, some of the most pressing problems we have globally. And you all are a big part of that solution. So thank you. We just have to become a priority and positions or position our science right for success and position it too so that we get buy-in from those who are the funders, those who are the decision makers. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck with your new enterprise. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.